Today's episode will be a special one, a true journey into the unknown to discover a piece of history that's been hidden away for decades. In this hobby of urban exploration, there are thousands of people constantly searching for the next great location to explore. And when something is discovered, news tends to spread fast. It's become increasingly rare to have your own moment of discovery, but when it does happen, it's the most rewarding this hobby ever gets. Our story today begins in Chicago, several years ago. This was the high voltage laboratory in the Crawford Generating Station, photographed by my friend Edwin. Constructed in the 1920s, this lab would have been used for experimentation and validation of numerous electrical components, a remnant of a time when electricity was a new and rapidly progressing industry. Despite its significance, it was unceremoniously demolished in 2019, just a few weeks before Brian and I eventually made it there. This lab fascinated me more than any other abandoned room that I had ever been aware of, and it was beginning to eat at me that I had just missed seeing it by a matter of weeks. I decided that if there was anything else like this still out there, I was going to find it. The real search began when I discovered archive.org and their vast catalog of decades-old trade journals. The string High Voltage Laboratory returned thousands of results, even after narrowing the search to US-based periodicals published from the 1920s through the mid-century. It soon became a nightly ritual of mine to find mentions of these laboratories in articles and advertisements and then attempt to confirm their current status. One of the first things I learned is that high voltage laboratories were far more numerous than I originally expected. The largest and most advanced facilities were located at General Electric and Westinghouse's plants, but utility companies, universities, and other private industries also made considerable investments into their own labs. Despite all these leads, finding a vintage voltage lab that could potentially still be intact proved elusive. GE's Pittsfield lab, demolished. Westinghouse's East Pittsburgh lab, demolished. Westinghouse Trafford, it's batting cages? Ohio Brass, long gone, but wow. This one was built out of an old mansion and the result looked like pure science fiction. Still empty-handed, the incredible images I was coming across only heightened my curiosity and spurred me to learn about these laboratories in more detail. High voltage labs first came into use in the early 20th century when electrical transmission systems began using increased voltages and more effective insulators were required. At this time, lightning also wreaked havoc on electrical equipment and the need to study and develop protective measures was growing. When lightning strikes an overhead power line, the insulators may be flashed over Wooden poles may be split. Another damage may be wrought by high voltage, invisible traveling waves that move at the speed of light. In 1921, a man working for General Electric by the name of Charles Proteus Steinmetz developed the first artificial lightning generator. While existing labs were already capable of extremely high voltages, Steinmetz's device was the first to discharge an electric pulse of high voltage and high current in a fraction of a second, replicating the characteristics of real lightning. This equipment was scaled up and soon artificial lightning was able to rival the power of nature's. High voltage testing equipment began to be shipped off to new laboratories across the country by manufacturers such as GE, Westinghouse, and Alice Chalmers. Two West Coast voltage labs at the universities of Stanford and Caltech were particularly noteworthy, built in the 1920s in partnership with local power companies. The lab at Caltech opened first and was housed in a beautifully ornate building. The main entrance was adorned by two figures of mythic stature, grabbing a cable with bolts of lightning emanating from it. Stanford's lab opened a few years later in a more humble structure, but capable of producing the greatest man-made voltages in the world at the time, 2.1 million volts. Its opening day was marked by demonstrations of electrical arcs crossing a 20-foot gap. These labs were instrumental in developing insulators and other long-range transmission technology, which were needed to bring power into California's cities from distant hydroelectric plants in the mountains. Perhaps the peak of high-voltage excitement occurred in 1939 at the New York World's Fair, when GE revealed their show-stealing Steinmetz Hall. Demonstrations of a 10 million volt machine thrilled millions of visitors to the pavilion. This description of the show from one of GE's own pamphlets gives a good idea of what it would have been like to be in attendance. 
The appearance of the demonstration hall in which the big generator performed, with the lights lowered, the red signal lamps glowing, and with the tall, forbidding stacks of black and chromium glittering evilly, was enough in itself to quicken any watcher's pulse. And the odor of ozone, which pervaded the atmosphere as a result of the past demonstrations, served to increase this feeling of tension and uneasiness. During the 15 seconds required for the big lightning generator to reach its full charge, the ominous hum of the apparatus put nerves on edge. They're almost up to full voltage. Uh, hold your ears. You have just seen the most powerful lightning bolt ever created by man. It was at this point, after days of research, that the lead I was waiting for finally smacked me in the face. An advertisement for a Baltimore-based insulator company known as Lock, proudly featuring a full-page image of their voltage laboratory. My pulse began to pick up as I quickly realized not only was the laboratory still standing, but the factory it was part of was currently abandoned and headed for demolition. Would there be anything left inside? Would it even be possible to get in? There was only one way to find out. Take extra steps to make sure you're secure when online with today's sponsor, NordVPN. NordVPN protects your online privacy by making sure your data is encrypted before it even leaves your device. Block websites, ISPs, and anyone else from tracking your internet usage and get around region restrictions by connecting to other regions' VPN servers. Using a VPN is especially important when connecting to public networks like a hotel, coffee shop, or an airport as you don't know who is managing their network or who will be connected to it. With 5,400 plus servers in 59 countries with super fast connections, you can browse the web without borders and without impacting your connection speed. And with their CyberSec and threat protection features, you can block malware and ads, avoid trackers, and block malicious downloads. You're also able to protect all of your devices, as one account supports six connections across all major operating systems. Every purchase of a two year plan will receive a huge discount, plus four bonus months for free. It's risk-free as every purchase is protected with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Just go to nordvpn.com slash properpeople or click the link in the description. The Lock Insulator Factory in Baltimore opened in 1922 after moving from a location in upstate New York. Founder Fred M. Locke devised his own improvements to insulators while working as a telegraph operator and soon started his own company. His company became the first in America to mass produce and popularize porcelain insulators, as opposed to the widely used glass insulators of the time. Upon moving the operation to Baltimore, General Electric became involved with the company, purchasing a significant stake. The lock facility would go on to become one of the foremost manufacturers and developers of insulators in the world, much to the credit of their high voltage laboratory. Now, unfortunately, we don't have any footage of the very first time we entered the lab. The first time we went in was just a scouting run and we went in with no cameras and no gear. But what you're about to see is the second time we visited the lab and the first time we went with our cameras rolling. On the scouting run, getting in proved difficult and our second visit would be met with similar complications as you're about to see. That guy's on his phone or something. Oh yeah. Okay, so we formulated a plan. <laughs> Not sure it's a good plan, but it's a plan. Yeah, it is. Basically, Frank Carson here is going to drive us past security. We're going to hop out and he's going to drive off and hopefully security won't notice that people have been dropped off. I mean, don't maybe duck down. It's going to be hard. We're, we're a little low. tight, when but you drive by, duck down. Yeah, yeah. We're go. Oh man, I see lights on inside. This looks really weird back here. He's not there. even here. Uh, are you sure? Uh, yeah, he's there. He's there. He's right they there. are there, yeah. Oh, they're not even lights on. They're big weird. Pull in as far back as you can to the thing. He's like trying to make noise with the doors though. I know, I know. Love to. Right here. This is as far as you can go. Can okay. they see us from here? No, I don't know. The trees. Yeah, let me turn around this way. Maybe. All right, well, I'll get out this door, yeah, okay? Me too.
plan is in motion. Now, what if we can't get in there and he's gone? What like, we're we gonna have to have him come back somehow. We can't, like, get to the place we need to get to. You know what I mean? We we'll come back here. Let's go. Yeah. We're in pretty plain view of the car. We should just hug it. Let's just go. Hey, make sure your screen stays off on your camera. Hey, we need to stay down here on these rocks. Okay. That's gonna bitch. We're gonna have to do it. No way. That's a truck. In the property. Exactly where we need to go. In the property or outside the property? Literally exactly where we need to go. A I'm fucking truck. It's on this side of the fence or that side of the fence? I don't know, but it's right where we need to go. I just had a thought. So. You know how there was a, a vehicle in the parking lot before? Yeah. And we thought that that was security's yeah, personal vehicle. Really that one's gone, right? There was no, no other moved. car there? Really? Oh, they're moving back in the parking lot. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's gone. So maybe this is the new security guard's personal vehicle. Maybe. Which would mean they're not in it. It's a risk. You think that's a security too? I think that could be their personal car that they parked there and they're in the security car. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that would be that too, but... Let's spy on the truck for a minute and see if we see any lights inside, like, a phone screen or something, okay? Yeah. All right. It's impossible to really see anything with that truck because that floodlight's in a perfect spot to blind us and give them a clear view of us. This is not ideal. Really hard to tell. Should we shine a light on it? No. Hell no, that's a terrible idea. So we've came to a decision, we're gonna send it and risk it. What if the, the, the truck opens its light, we just bail out? If he turns on his lights? Yeah, walk away. If, we, if we're obviously seen, we just need to start leaving. They're gonna ask us what the fuck we're doing though. I don't know where to go. Should I, I, I go behind or what? No, in front, because I don't think anyone's in the car. I just think we need to avoid the security car up there. We go behind the truck? No, in front. Stay on the shore. Because there's nobody in the truck, I don't think. That's what we're banking on. Okay. I'm going to follow you anyway.
Is this second sticker new? No. Okay. I don't think so. That's the logo we were like comparing it to. Remember? We were saying that's not the logo that was on the trucks. It is though, isn't it? No, Wolf Security was on the trucks. Oh, okay. These are like some kind of lathe maybe? I have no idea. These look like polishing wheels. This whole shelf is still stocked. This is all porcelain ceramic making stuff. Big mixing pots or something. So that's the room that has the cameras. The lights in. were off last time. The cameras were in that room. With the lights turned off. Voltage lab is closed. Yeah, this was open last time. Got a control panel here of some kind. Everything's caged in to act as a Faraday cage. Really old looking meter there. General Electric. These three transformers formed what's known as a cascade set and were the backbone of the lab. The secondary windings of one transformer would be hooked up to the primary of the next, gradually stepping up the voltage. The light blue posts the transformers are sitting on are insulators and they grow in height with each successive unit to properly insulate each one from the ground.
They are massive. Yeah, it's tall. Ginormous. I think the slab was capable of over a million volts, That's maybe a two lot million. Of volts. The impulse generator, also known as a Marx generator, was the most formidable piece of equipment in the lab. It was essentially a group of capacitors that were charged in parallel with DC voltage to a predetermined value. Each capacitor was separated by a spark gap, and when triggered, an electric arc would form between them, connecting them all in series. The result was a pulse of up to 3 million volts, reaching peak amplitude in just one and a half microseconds. This man-made lightning would be used to test the effects of power surges, such as those caused by real lightning, on various components found on the electric grid. Given the fact that Locke was an insulator factory, most of the tests performed here were done to learn the breakdown properties of insulators under various conditions. However, the lab also performed consulting work for outside companies who were interested in testing all types of equipment. In order to obtain high voltage DC current, a set of Kinetron vacuum tubes was used to rectify the alternating current from the transformers. The Kinetron set may have been removed from the lab at some point, as I don't recall seeing it. The next important pieces of equipment in the lab are the sphere gaps. They could serve various different purposes, but one of the primary uses was for measuring voltage. Given the uniform surface of the spheres, an arc bridging a gap of constant distance would also be at constant voltage, plus or minus 3%. Therefore, for any given distance between the two spheres, the voltage of a spark between them would be known. Check out this folding chair and this piece of equipment on it. That folding chair has got to be old. 1950s, maybe even older. I am the scientist of the lab. Okay. And today we're going to explain how all this right. works. Tell us all about it. So, where do I start? <laughs> He's a fraud. There's all kinds of old equipment in here. Jeez. It's fully stocked. We got a little control panel here as well. Have a meter for sphere gap spacing. What date is this fire extinguisher from? 1981. That gives wow. you an idea of this desk when it was used last. Yeah, even though the factory only shut down recently, I don't think they used the lab yeah. for a very long time. different kinds of insulators in there. Look at the drawing on it. It's pretty sick. This looks pretty old. Alright, come on, can we see some drawings? Porcelain insulators. It's just, okay, here's drawings. This cabinet's completely rusting out. So here's the motor generator. 
I believe this front part here was the generator. Yeah, this was the motor. And it looks like the motor was actually replaced with something more modern. But this generator looks original. These look like some really old, huge multimeters. They had bird safe devices that would not arc if a bird happened to complete the circuit or something with another mini insulator. This is like a big movable staircase they could use to service stuff. Looks like you were allowed to smoke in the lab until 1995. Oh, there's blueprints here. Load capacitor stack assembly. Nineteen eighty four calendar on the thing. A bunch of books about aluminum, modern plastics encyclopedia, handbook of chemistry and physics. Ohio Brass, they were basically a competitor to Locke, if I remember correctly. Made the same type of equipment. EHV, electrical high voltage. And there's an arc flashover. Oh, wow. So that's basically what they were testing in here. At what point would their insulators flash over? Let's see if there's any other wall pictures. You get the idea. Just lots of pictures of transmission towers. Found something. Bingo. Historical photo of the lab. It looks way better with those colors. Yeah. I mean, we can't really tell the colors, but that is they not were red stupid. And blue. Yeah. Um, let's find a place I can put this down and pop it open. Got pictures of substations. Just Nothing did a catalog. Extraordinary. Yeah. I want to see photos of the test equipment. Oh, there it is. This is here. Nice. So this thing has definitely been in here for a long time. The impulse generator. I'm trying to find a photo of that room with something arcing. And you can clearly see it's that room. That would be sick. Yeah. Continuing upwards. Yo, there's a control panel here. This is definitely the master control panel. This is where the guy controlling the show would be. Nice scissor switch right there. It's where you pull the lever and activate everything. I don't know. Looks like it though. I just noticed there's a huge gantry crane in this room. Makes sense for all the stuff they'd have to move. It's 
It's crazy how big this room is. Without this light on in the corner, the shadows they make are pretty cool over here. It's the vent up there. Yeah, it is. It's really windy. This is just storage over here. Files. Which looks like paperwork. Oh yeah, sales. Boring yeah. shit. Old paperwork. Oh, this is the view right here. Should one of us stay here and the other goes in for scale? Sure. Also check out that Doritos bag in the corner, right behind you. Oh, it's an old one. It's like a drawing of an insulator. Following this visit, we managed to make one return trip to the lab, this time photographing it in the daylight. There were only a few unsealed windows, but the equipment looked even more captivating under the soft natural light. The echoes of a thunderstorm outside provided a very fitting atmosphere. Unfortunately, since the filming of this video, the high voltage laboratory at Locke has been completely leveled to make way for housing. Electrical infrastructure like transmission lines and substations are such a common sight in the landscape that they're almost invisible. However, since visiting the lab, I've begun to view them with a new sense of fascination, always checking out what kinds of insulators are being used. 
The power of historic places like Locke is that they can show us the lineage of technological breakthroughs that most of us now take for granted. They're monuments to the decades of human progress that led us to where we are today. It saddens me that the Locke Laboratory, a place likely unmatched by anything else still in existence, has been lost to time. This story is not yet over, however, and the ending is not as bleak as I may have led you to believe. At the final hour before demolition, a man by the name of Jeff Bahari was able to negotiate the rescue of some of the lab's equipment, most notably the impulse generator and the sphere gaps. Jeff is determined to not only preserve this equipment, but to get it up and running again for all to see and enjoy. He's already been running a museum featuring a wide range of vintage electrical apparatus, but in order to house and operate the equipment from Locke, he's going to need a bigger building. He's recently established the museum as a nonprofit at considerable expense to himself, and now needs help covering the cost of shipping the equipment down to its new home in Florida. Getting to see this equipment come to life again is something I never thought was a possibility when I first entered the lab, and it would be an amazing end to the story to see it preserved and inspiring the public for many years to come. I'll include a link to his GoFundMe below for anyone who would like to help out. <laughs>